Hello and welcome to this guide to hard mode care pack for beginners. I'm going to be focusing on a solo mode in this guide, but everything that I teach in this video will also apply to group mode. Fighting a hard mode care pack in a group is significantly easier than in a solo, so I thought we would teach everything in a solo and that way you can do whatever type of care pack you would like with the information in this video. To kick things off, here is some general information about care pack in hard mode. He has a total of 1.7 million life points as well as an affinity or base hit chance of 55. He has no weakness, and he is immune to stuns, although he is not immune to poison. His attack speed is slow, with an interval of 2.4 seconds or 4 game ticks, and his maximum hit is 5,000 plus damage. The last thing that's important and relevant to the boss is that if you have a Noden Dragon Can Slayer assignment with level 92, you will benefit from the Slayer Helmet boosts for the majority of the fight. If you are planning on learning this boss, it is exceptionally useful to have a Noden Dragon Can Slayer assignment, although in this video for all of my backing clips, I was not on a task. Next up, and before we get into the nitty gritty, I want to talk a little bit about what a beginner guide means, as this is sometimes confusing to some people. This guide assumes that you've unlocked things like invention as well as overloads. It does not expect you to have high tier gear or expensive perks. It does not expect you to have expensive ability or prayer unlocks, and it does not expect you to be able to navigate switches with ease. That being said, it does feature a few switches as optional items, and they'll all be explained in detail so you can decide for yourself if they're worth the effort of using. With that out of the way, it's time to take a look at our gear and inventory setup for this boss fight. I'm going to take you through all of the items one by one right now, and after that, we're going to talk about some of the decisions you'll want to make with your setup before attempting hard mode Carapack. Now we're going to have a look at a gear and invent setup. Everything in here is merely a suggestion, but this is what I went with for this video. We're going to start things off with Ganondermic gloves as well as Ganondermic boots, and in my ring slot, I've got the Asylum Surgeon's ring. After that, I've got Ganodermic Leggings that are augmented with Crackling 4, Mobile, and Biting 3. My Ganodermic Poncho is augmented with Enhanced Devoted and Impatient 4, and of all the armor perks I'm using, by far the most important one is Enhanced Devoted 4. The other ones are a little less critical. On the weapon side of things, I'm using a Wand of the Elders with the Precise 6 perk, and then my offhand is an Augmented Virtus Book with the Equilibrium 4 perk. The reason I'm using a Virtus book instead of an Elder Orb is all of your accuracy comes from your main hand, and as a result of this, the Virtus book and the Elder Orb are exactly the same when it comes to damage, as they are both tier 80. In my necklace slot, I've got an Amulet of Souls, and I'm using a Takar Cal Medge, but you could also replace that with a Defense Cape if you wanted to. In my helmet slot, I've got a Ganodermic Visor, and I'm using a Scrimshaw of the Elements in my pocket slot. Last up on the rune front, I have two separate rune pouches. I have Chaos Runes, Blood Runes, Fire Runes, Dust runes, death runes, and soul runes, which allows me to cast Exsanguinate, Smoke Cloud, and Animate Dead. On the food front, I've chosen to bring Blue Blubber Jellyfish. They're very convenient as they can be eaten without losing adrenaline, but if you wanted to, you could also substitute them out for something like Sailfish, although my recommendation would be to go with the Blubbers. After that, I've got a set of Saradomen Brews. They can be eaten at the same time as a Blubber Jellyfish or a conventional food, so they're really good for healing lots of life points all at once. Outside of the food, I've got an augmented sun spear for planted feet, as well as a ring of vigor. To the right of that, I've got a weapon poison that I'll consume before I enter the fight, as well as a power burst of vitality that I'll get into a little bit later in the video. I then have an Excalibur for the heals, as well as two different shields. I've got an Ancient Lantern, which is classed as a Defender, as well as a Merciless Kite Shield. The Defender is augmented with Equilibrium 4, and the Merciless Kite Shield has Turtling 4 on it. I'll be going into detail as to when you'd want to use the Defender versus when you'd want to use the Shield, but if you're not into such things, you can absolutely bring one or the other and you won't have any issues with this boss. Outside of that, I've got some Super Restores, some Vulnerability Bombs, a Replenishment Potion, and an Overload. I'm also just going to mention here that I was able to complete all of my kills with this setup without using any food at all. This is sort of a set of recommended things that I think are good to bring, but if you don't have all of them, I wouldn't worry too much. On the subject of auras, the Berserker type auras will generally result in the fastest kills, but also the most damage taken. For a first attempt, I would recommend either an Accuracy Aura, like Runic Accuracy, Brawler, and Sharpshooter, or the Majorat Aura. On the familiar side of things, a Ripper Demon will yield faster kills, but will also allow less room for error. A Yakker Mammoth will allow for eating through all mechanics, but can result in slower learning as you will be able to brute force. The preference is completely up to you, and for the majority of my sample kills, I chose to use no familiar at all. You may have noticed that I'm wearing a lot of tank gear in my suggested setup, and this is specifically for the Animate Dead spell. It's a spell that requires the City of Sentiston quest and level 84 magic to use. 
It greatly reduces incoming damage while wearing magic type tank gear, and it is recommended while learning, but is absolutely not required and it can be substituted for power gear. If you choose to use power gear or a non-magic combat style, this guide will still work and we'll be talking about exactly what that's going to look like a little later on as well. On the subject of archaeology relics, none are required for this boss fight, but the optimal PVMing relic setup is Berserker's Fury, Fury of the Small, and then either the Death Ward or the Font of Life as your third slot. One relic I will be highlighting as very useful specifically for this boss fight is Fury of the Small. You'll be completely fine without it, but if you do have it, it can help quite a bit. Now I want to briefly touch on the Pontifex Shadow Ring. The Pontifex Shadow Ring is a reward for completing the City of Senescent quest. When combined with a thousand resonant anima of Jass that can be obtained from normal mode care pack, as well as the mobs on the node in front or the Grand Exchange, it will simplify several of care pack's mechanics. It is recommended to do this before attempting hard mode Carapac. The ring does not have to be equipped or in your invent to benefit from the simplification of mechanics as it unlocks as a passive. I touched on this briefly in the introduction, but let's talk about solo versus group mode. Solo is far more difficult than group because Carapac does not scale in difficulty. This means that a trio would be three players against the exact same amount of HP and the same mechanics as you'd get in a solo. To make up for this, solo care pack is significantly more rewarding. If you were to trio care pack, each player would get one loot pile. If you were to duo care pack, one player would get two loot piles and the other player would get one. And if you're to solo care pack, you will receive all three loot piles every single kill. Now let's do a quick overview of the phases themselves. Phase 1 will take care pack from 450,000 to 50,000 life points, and then he will heal back up to full for phase 2, that will once again take you from 450,000 life points to 50,000 life points. Upon reaching 50,000 life points, he will heal all the way up one final time for phase 3, that will take you from 450k all the way to 50k. As soon as you reach 50,000 life points in phase 3, phase 4 will begin. Phase 4 has a total of 500,000 life points, and as soon as Carapac's life points hit zero, you will have successfully completed a kill. I know that was a lot, but we've now covered all of the background information on the boss, and it's time to actually get into how to successfully complete every mechanic. It's time for the first of three mechanics that this boss fight predominantly features. It's called the Tear. Carapac will yell, I'll tear right through you, and raise his arms before slamming them downward toward the player. You'll initially be hit by small amounts of magic damage, and a time rift will spawn behind the player along the edge of the arena. If you do not move from the area between Carapac and the time rift, you'll be hit for rapid low magic hits, and you'll also be stunned. The time rift will periodically deal 500 damage to the player until it is killed, and it is 15,000 life points. There are two primary ways of dealing with the tear. There's the proper way, and then there's the preferred way. We'll start off with the proper way. As soon as Carapex says, I will tear you apart, you'll use freedom to prevent yourself from being stunned, and use devotion with magic prayer active to take no damage, and you'll simply go over to the tear and kill it. The preferred way to deal with this mechanic is to skip it entirely. If you stand directly under Carapac as he says, I will tear right through you, a tear will not spawn, you will not be stunned, and you will not take any damage. This requires better timing than method 1, but it does make the mechanic significantly easier once mastered. I will also note that if you do not stand under Carapac correctly at any point in the fight and a tear spawns, you'll no longer be able to skip the tear by standing under the boss. So as soon as you miss time at once or misstep once, you'll have to use option 1 for the remainder of the boss fight. In my experience, if you're planning on doing this boss for any length of time, I would strongly advise learning how to stand under Carapac. You can pre-right-click walk here underneath him, and then as soon as his arms go up, all you have to do is click one time, you'll get right underneath the boss every single time, and that's one of the three main mechanics dealt with just like that. I'm also going to note that it is confirmed that they will not be patching this or changing this. The tear skip will be staying in the game indefinitely. The second of three mechanics we're going to be looking at is the melee jump. Carapac will say, you will break beneath me, or I will put you in your place, and you will fly into the air before diving at your current location. To dodge the melee jump, use Surge, Escape, or Bladed Dive when Carapac's legs separate. It can be a little iffy on the timing front, but regardless of your ping, there should be a point in the animation where if you hit your mobility ability, it will dodge it correctly. If timed correctly, all of your mobility abilities will also be reset. If timed incorrectly, Carapac will land on the ground and deal rapid melee damage to you until you run away from him. It's worth noting that the Devotion ability does not reduce incoming damage from the melee jump. He'll just hit you right through it. I'm also going to mention that if you do not have an upgraded Pontifex Shadow Ring, the melee jump will also stun you, and that's the primary reason why I'd recommend getting a Pontifex Shadow Ring upgraded before attempting hard mode Carapac. Carapac will jump a total of three times before moving on to the next mechanic. Let's watch this over and over again in slow-mo. 
As you can see, the second his legs separate backwards, I'm going to hit my surge keybind and it's going to allow me to flawlessly dodge the melee jump. This mechanic is very satisfying once mastered, but it's not a huge deal if you are not perfect with the timing as you can completely avoid surging and just run away from it each time. You'll take a couple small melee hits and then you can move on with your day. The third and final mechanic of the first three phases is lightning. Carepack will say, witness the power of the staff, and a wall of lightning will appear on one side of the arena, moving through the entirety of the room. This lightning hits 3000 plus damage per game tick if you stand in it, but it can be easily dodged by using surge or bladed dive. On the later phases, you'll get multiple sets of lightning out at once, and you can consider using either debilitate or debilitate with reflect to greatly reduce the incoming damage and make the mechanic completely safe. As you can see in this clip, I am intentionally walking in the lightning as much as humanly possible, but because I've used debilitate and reflect, the damage is exceptionally manageable. If you tried to do this without the defensives, you would die within about a second. Now that we've been through each of the primary mechanics of the boss fight, it's time to go phase by phase for the first three phases of the boss fight. Phase one will lead off with a tear, and then follow up with a melee jump, and then follow that up with lightning. Carepack will continue to repeat these same three mechanics in order until you reach the phase HP of 50,000 life points. As soon as you phase the boss, you'll end up in phase two, that will start once again at the top of this list with a tear. Phase 2 features the exact same 3 mechanics as Phase 1 in the exact same order, but you'll get 2 walls of lightning instead of 1. Phase 2 also gives you the ability to warp time, and we're going to talk about that in detail right now. When warp time becomes available at the start of the second phase, the special action button will appear on your screen. When pressed, the game will take a snapshot of your character's life points, ability cooldowns, position, and your adrenaline percent. For the next 10 seconds, any abilities you use, damage you take, and adrenaline you use will effectively be free, as after 10 seconds, warp time will end and you'll be reverted back to your exact position and cooldowns that you had before pressing the special action button. Warp time has a 30 second cooldown and should be generally used as often as possible. Warp time can be slightly difficult to wrap your head around as, as far as mechanics are concerned, it's probably the most unique and cool mechanic in the entire game. It effectively allows you to do whatever you want for 10 seconds and then be reverted back in time to where you were before. Now that you know how warp time works, let's talk about the actual strategies for how to get the most out of it. The general strategy for warp time is to use a damage boosting ultimate ability like Sunshine, Death Swiftness, or Berserk, as Warp Time will allow you to circumvent the regular 60 second cooldown, and you'll instead be able to use it every 30 seconds whenever Warp Time becomes available. It can also be used defensively, with abilities like Barricade, Immortality, or Devotion, in order to activate them without putting them on cooldown. How this would work is, you would use Warp Time, and then at some point in that 10 second period, you'd use a defensive ability like Devotion. After Warp Time ends, you will still be in Devotion, but it will also be off cooldown and available to be used again. I'm also going to add that if you have the Limitless ability, you can use an ultimate ability and then use Strong Thresholds right away. When Warp Time ends, you'll then be able to reuse those Strong Thresholds immediately after. I am not using the Limitless ability in this video, but I did want to mention that if you do have it, it can be very handy. While you gain the ability to Warp Time from Phase 2 onwards in the Karapak boss fight, so will Karapak. He has the ability to summon an echo of himself that will echo his mechanics based on the placement from the previous phase. This means that if you had a melee jump all the way north on phase one, you would see in phase two an echo of Karapak's phase one self doing that exact same jump in the exact same place on phase two. This is generally very easy to avoid as all you have to do is move around the room a little bit between each phase and they shouldn't really interact with you at all. At the same time, you will absolutely notice a gold echo of Karapak echoing some of his attacks towards you. These echoes cannot be killed in any way, and once again, so long as you're moving around the room between phases just the tiniest amount, you should be able to avoid them completely. Phase 3 is exactly the same as phases 1 and 2, except you'll receive 3 walls of lightning whenever you encounter that special attack. Outside of that, you are completely smooth sailing until Karapak reaches 50,000 life points, which is when phase 4 will begin. Now we're going to talk about phase 4, the phase where everything gets just a little bit more intense. Phase 4 has two main sections. There's part 1 where you're dealing with the echoes, and then part 2 where you've got to finish off the boss. For the duration of phase 4, Karapak will gain in rage in the form of Karapak's Fury. Later on in this guide, I'll just be referring to it as Fury. For each stack, Karapak will deal 1% increased damage and reduce the effectiveness of your protection prayers by 0.25%. At the start of phase four, three echoes of Karapak will spawn, with each having 100,000 life points. Three copies of your character will spawn as well and begin to fight the echoes. 
you may click on the copies to immediately take over them with the remaining life points replacing yours. The Echoes of Karapak will attack the copies of your character until the copies of your character have been killed. So they'll tank for you for a short time, but once they've been killed, the Echoes of Karapak will turn to you and begin to attack you in addition to Karapak, who is also at the side of the arena, immune to damage and throwing magic attacks at you. For each copy of your character that dies, Karapak and the Echoes will gain 25 stacks of fury. For each Echo that dies, Karapak and the remaining Echoes will also gain 50 stacks of fury. The general strategy is to allow the copies of your character to tank for as long as they can, and then allow them to die. It's best to kill all three Echoes at a similar time to reduce the amount of time that the boss is on high fury stacks. In the simplest terms, here's what you want to do. You want to move from Echo to Echo, lowering them each approximately to 10,000 life points. When the copies of your character begin to die and your fury stacks increase, begin using defensive abilities to reduce incoming damage. As soon as you're able to kill all three Echoes, Karapak will then become attackable and you can finish off the boss that way. Here's a list of defensive abilities that will reduce your damage taken from all targets. Anticipate is a basic ability that will reduce your damage taken by 10% for 10 seconds. Devotion is a threshold ability that will reduce your damage taken when aligned with your protection prayers by 100% for 10 seconds. Reflect is a threshold ability that requires a shield or defender equipped, and it will reduce your damage taken by 50% for 10 seconds. Immortality is an ultimate ability that also requires a shield or defender equipped. It will reduce your damage taken by 25% for 30 seconds, and if you are to die in that 30 second span, you'll be revived. Last but not least, the last offensive I wanted to bring some attention to is Barricade. It requires a shield or a defender to use, and it will reduce 100% of damage taken for 14 plus seconds. With the set of defensive abilities comes a reminder that you can activate defensive abilities within warp time to immediately be able to use them a second time after it ends. Now that we've broadly talked about some defensive abilities that are useful to use, let's talk about how we'd actually want to approach this aspect of the fight and how to actually use defensive abilities in phase four. First off, why would you want to use defensives in the first place? The main advantage of using defensive abilities is to allow you to spend as much time as possible with damage reduction active, allowing you to deal damage to the echoes without having to constantly eat food. There are infinite ways to deal with the incoming damage on phase four, and this should not necessarily be memorized, but I found these abilities in roughly this order to be quite effective for reducing the incoming damage on phase four. As soon as the clones of my character begin to die, I'll start things off by using Reflect. You can also use the Revenge ability at the same time to increase your damage dealt. Following up this Reflect, I'll activate Warp Time, and then I will use Devotion as soon as I'm low HP or towards the end of the Warp Time. As soon as that Devotion comes off, I will then use the Devotion ability a second time. When that Devotion's ready to wear off, I will then use the Reflect ability, and by this point, I should be getting pretty close to killing all of the clones. If the clones of Karapak have not died at this point, I'll then circle through the ultimate abilities, Barricade and Immortality, and that should get me more than enough time. If it doesn't though, Reflect and Devotion will both be coming off cooldown towards the end of those ultimates, so you can kind of take your time with this one and go through it however you'd like to. I'm also going to mention that if you're bringing both a shield and a defender, Reflect and Immortality are both best used with a defender, whereas you want to use your high tier shield, preferably with the turtling perk for Barricade. Once all three Echoes have been defeated, you can begin to attack Karapak. He has 200,000 life points, and as soon as they're lowered to zero, you will have completed a kill. Karapak is likely to have 225 stacks of fury, and because of this, he'll be dealing very high damage, hitting up to 4,000 damage through your prayer. Use defensive abilities as needed to keep your life points high. In addition to the defensive abilities from the previous slide, Karapak being one singular target allows for the effective use of two others. Debilitate is a threshold ability that does not require a shield that will reduce your damage by 50% for 10 seconds. Other than Debilitate, we've got Resonance and Preparation that are both basic abilities. Resonance will heal one attack of damage and then Preparation will reduce the cooldown on Resonance, allowing you to use it more frequently. Resonance is an extremely strong ability and it can really carry you through the last phase as resing one singular magic attack can prevent you from having to eat a bunch of food. It's once again worth noting that you will heal more life points the higher tier of shield you have, so if you were to use Resonance with a Defender equipped, you will heal slightly less than if you are using your high tier shield. Here are three other useful tips that you can consider using at Karapak. The first one in particular is exceptionally useful and I would strongly recommend giving it a try. The second two, maybe not so much, but I did want to mention them. When entering a clone on phase four, you can drink a power burst of vitality and then click on a different clone. 
Doing this will give the initial clone that you power bursted in 20,000 life points, allowing it to tank for significantly longer. This increases the amount of time that Karapak will have low stacks of fury, so it can make the boss fight a little bit easier for you. Secondly, if you're using ranged, you can use the Seer Call special attack on phases 1 to 3 to lower Karapak's magic level to 0. This will make his attacks significantly less accurate for the remainder of the fight. If you are using range and you're learning, it's not a terrible idea, but it shouldn't be necessary. And in testing, it brought Karapak's hit chance from 70% down to 50%. The last tip is not so much of a tip, but something that I wanted to mention. You can use food to heal up the clones of your character and prevent them from dying. This is done by clicking on a clone and then healing to full with food from your invent or beast of burden before clicking on a different clone. This is not a recommended method as it will require an absolute ton of food to do and it will slow down your kills dramatically. But if you wanted to give it a try, you're more than welcome to. Now, as promised, let's talk about doing phase 4 without the animate dead spell. In all of the backing clips you've seen prior to this point, I've been using tank gear and I haven't used a single food throughout this entire video. But now, let's talk about phase 4 without animate dead. The first thing I'm going to do at the start of the phase is I'm going to enter a warp time and then I'm going to cast sunshine. I'm going to go across the room and I'm going to use a power burst of vitality just like we talked about. It's going to lower my HP, but the clone's life points will be doubled. At this point, I'm just going to focus on getting the first echo of Karapak fairly low on life points, and I'm going to continue to combo eat my bruise and blubber jellyfish as my life points drop. Phase 4 should take a little bit of food unless you're playing extremely defensively, and that's not a bad thing at all. Once the first clone is relatively low, about 9,000 life points, I'm going to swap over to the second echo. Right around 10,000 life points is the sweet spot for the first echo. This is because not only is the first echo likely to be poisoned, but we'll also be using the reflect ability fairly often, which reduces damage taken by 50%, but also reflects it back on the attacker. If our echo is too low in life points, it could die early, and that will result in us taking extra damage from all the remaining echoes and carapac for the remainder of the fight. You'll see that I'm going through the exact rotation I outlined in the video prior to this. I'm doing a second warp time between the second and third echoes, I'm sunshining, I'm drinking my adrenaline potion, and then I'm using the devotion ability. After my warp time ends, I'm devotioning a second time, and then after that my reflect is available, and I'm going to finish off the remaining echoes just under reflect. Although if I needed to, I was fairly high adrenaline, and I could have used barricade or immortality, but I didn't think it was necessary with my food situation. Once the echoes are dead, it's fairly simple. We're going to get on Karapak, we're going to do as much damage as we possibly can with our Elder Wand and Virtus book, and as soon as the boss dies, we will have successfully completed a kill. At this stage of the video, it's time to put everything together, and I'm just going to commentate over one full kill at double speed. The reason it's double speed is, especially in the first three phases, the mechanics get very repetitive very quickly. You'll see that I begin to attack Karapak, and now it's time for the melee jump. I'm going to be surging through all of them, but you will see throughout this kill, there are times that I do get hit by it, and it's not the end of the world. If you're praying deflect melee, it's less than 500 damage taken, so long as you move out of it quickly. After that, I've got my first lightning wall, and I see that it spawns very far away from me, which is very convenient. On occasion, you can have the lightning walls spawn right next to you, and you need to be pretty vigilant just in case. I'm also going to mention that the lightning walls are a little bit iffy in terms of hitbox and there are times that you won't actually be in range of the lightning wall and it's still going to hit you. It's just a really frustrating thing and that's why I'd recommend surging a little earlier than you normally would or using a defensive because that works really well too. We're now in our second cycle of mechanics and it's the melee jump once again. I'm going to do my surges and then I'm going to get ready for the second lightning wall. These mechanics will repeat indefinitely until I get the boss to 50,000 life points, so there's kind of no maximum or minimum amount of times you're going to experience them, but they're all good practice. Now phase 2 is going to start, and you're going to notice I activate warp time the second the phase starts. Generally, the sooner you start using it, the sooner you'll be able to use it for the remainder of the kill, and the sooner it's going to come back off cooldown, so you want to use it pretty much right away. I'm also going to mention here, as you can see, I did step under care pack correctly, but I still got a tear because earlier on in the phase, I stepped incorrectly, and I'm going to be dealing with tears for the remainder of the kill because of that. If you mess it up on phase one, it's not a terrible idea to just teleport out and start over again because you're not really losing a whole lot, but it's completely up to you. Now we're into our next set of lightning, and you're going to see in a second here that I actually mess it up and I do get hit ever so slightly. The lightning's only really, really bad if you get caught running along with it because it will hit you every game tick. You will also notice that now that we're in phase two, you will occasionally see the echo of Karapak from the prior phase in the exact position that Karapak was in phase one. He'll be mimicking the tear as well as the melee jump. While the mechanics repeat themselves here, I'm going to talk a little bit about what my objectives are from a damage output standpoint. I'm trying to use the sunshine ability with warp time every 30 seconds as often as humanly possible, and outside of that, I'm prioritizing wild magic and asphyxiate. 
My strongest basic abilities are Greater Concentrated Blast as well as Dragon Breath, and outside of that, there's really not a whole lot else I'm paying attention to. As long as I'm prioritizing those abilities, the boss fight should go down fairly effectively. Something else you'll notice that I'm not doing the best job of is keeping the boss debuff. You want to make sure that Carapac is under vulnerability as well as Smoke Cloud for as long of the fight as possible, as having both of those things up at the same time will increase your damage output by like 15% without doing anything. Over the course of this entire boss fight, that's equal to over 200,000 damage for free just by making sure the boss is debuffed. As we get into phase three here, you're going to notice that the first three phases are extremely repetitive. There's not a whole lot you have to worry about or a whole lot that changes between phases one, two, or three. But of course, in phase three, you will have two echoes of Carapac, one from the first phase and one from the second. Once again, they can largely be ignored and there's not a whole lot to worry about. We've got our set of lightning where I am intentionally running through it as much as possible just to show that if you're using defensive abilities properly, you don't really have to worry about the lightning at all. But I'm also going to mention here that if you're unsure about the lightning or you're a little spooked by it, it's a viable strategy to just use barricade. I think it's a really good opportunity to practice defensive ability stacking with your thresholds and that's why I've explained it that way in the guide, but barricade is always a decent option. I also wish I didn't have to mention this, but you will notice on phase three that parts of the lightning, especially along the edges of the arena, become completely invisible. Visible. This lightning is still very real and it will one-shot you, so that's an additional reason why defensive abilities and our barricade, especially on phase 3, is extremely important. It seems like a very frequent thing in recent RuneScape boss releases to have some sort of highly damaging position-based mechanic that will occasionally spawn in invisible, and to me, I think that's extremely unfair to a new player, so that's an additional reason why you definitely need to be very careful of the lightning, especially on the third phase. Along the same lines, you'll notice that for every tear, I'm using Devotion and I'm being hit zeros for magic damage even while I'm not standing within the beam. It's another situation where the hitbox just does not load in correctly, so it will appear like I'm not standing in it, I shouldn't take damage, but all of a sudden I'm getting hit for thousands. That's an additional reason why I think the Devotion ability is extremely good if you are going to be getting tears. And once again, I wish it was something I didn't have to mention in a guide, but I'd be remiss if I didn't. It's important to bring up points where it'll look like you've done the mechanic completely perfectly, but you're still taking damage. And that's not on you guys doing anything wrong at all, it's just an issue with the hitbox. We're picking things up partway through the fourth phase. I've already lowered my first echo, and I've also lowered my second one now, and I'm going to begin attacking the third one. At this point, I've already used Warp Time to use Devotion twice, and now I'm going to go through Barricade. At this point, I'm trying to use as little food as possible just to show what it would look like to play it very defensively, but if I was doing a regular standard kill and it wasn't for a guide, I would likely be using some of my food to keep my life points a little bit higher and effectively turn that HP I can heal into more damage output and allow me to not have to use quite as many defensives. I think the main takeaway with this boss fight is that if you go in without any defensives, you're going to have the worst experience of all time. But defensive abilities in RuneScape are so incredibly powerful, and if used correctly, you can mitigate an absolutely ridiculous amount of damage completely for free. As we move into the final part of phase 4, you will notice that I've properly debuffed the boss, and I'm rotating Debilitate, Reflect, and Devotion while using Resonance and Preparation as often as I can. Another thing I'm doing is I'm using Warp Time to Sunshine, as that's a really good way to get some free damage off, and when the Warp Time ends, I'll be back on full Adrenaline and able to use defensive abilities again if I need to. As soon as Carapac's life points reach zero, congratulations, you have successfully soloed Carapac in hard mode. Okay, I think that just about covers everything. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, feel free to leave a comment down below, I read every single one. Outside of that, I hope everyone is well, and best of luck with Carapac.